Well, last week we started a series called It's Just a Phase, a series that's all about family. So just out of curiosity, how, how many of you are part of a family of some sort? Okay, good. Then, then this will apply to you. And, and what we said last week was that every person is part of a family and every family is in a phase. We're all at a phase. And so your family right now, no matter what it looks like, is at a phase. And, and depending on the phase that we're in, we can be tempted to dismiss that phase or to be frustrated by that phase or just try to get through that phase or survive that phase. But for this series, we're trying to ask ourselves this, how can we get the most out of the phase that we're in, no matter what phase we're in right now? And so our working definition of phase for these few weeks is simply this, right? Rather than a phase being something we're trying to just endure or, or get through or survive, here's what a phase is. A phase is a time frame in someone's life when you can leverage distinctive opportunities to influence their future. Again, a phase is a time frame in someone's life when you can leverage distinctive opportunities to influence their future. And here's what we believe. We believe that there are things that God wants to do in your family and through your family, and we want to do everything we can do to help you with that as a church. So we want to be partners with you in the realm of family, no matter what family looks like. And so last week we talked through the different phases that kids can be in, different needs that they have, different questions that they're asking, and, and, and different things that they might need to know about God at each phase. And so as part of that last week, we gave out what we call phase guides for parents who have kids or grandparents who have kids in each of those phases. And so I just want to say again, if you weren't able to be with us or you weren't able to get one of those, we still have some available. So you can email me right now at Travis at the village Nashville.com and tell me your kids ages or grandkids ages or whatever that is. And I'll email you a copy of the phase guide for that particular age. So today I want to explore a topic that I'm sure actually doesn't really apply to many people. It's a very niche topic, affects a you know very narrow slice of the population. I want to talk about family fights. Anybody ever been part of a family fight? Right? Some of you were part of a fight, a family fight just to get here today. I'm I'm sure of it. Um, tomorrow, Amanda and I will be celebrating 18 years of being in official family fights together. So tomorrow our marriage will be old enough to vote. Congratulations to us. Um, I've heard it said that some families are sweet, right? They use manners and they're polite to each other and they're conscientious. And, and you hear them say things like, oh, my dear brother, would you like the last piece of cake? I, I do desire it for myself, but since you completed all of my chores for me today, I've decided that you should have it, right? Sweet families. And then some families, on the other hand, are spicy and they have big opinions and they have big feelings and they make those things known to each other without reservation. And so Garners, for instance, we're known to be a very sweet bunch. OK, that's that's a joke. Uh, a few years ago, one of our boys, he was in preschool at the time. He, he'd done something that he wasn't supposed to do. I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, but instead of owning up to it, when we asked him about it, he started blaming his brothers. And when we, when we asked him to stop blaming, he said really loudly, I'm not blaming. And then he points at his brothers, these guys are blaming, right? We're a, we're a spicy bunch in the Garner family. They're sweet and spicy. There's also hot and cold. So some families fight hot and some families fight cold. If a family fights hot, it's clear that they're spicy because there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of volume and, and all kinds of other things that go along with that. But some families fight cold. And when a family fights cold, there's a lot of silence. And the silence, it can be more deafening than the volume of the family who fights hot. I mean, there's silence in the car. There's silence at the dinner table. There's passive aggressiveness, which takes more effort than just regular aggressiveness. And then some families are so gifted at fighting that they can fight both hot and cold. And unfortunately, they don't necessarily balance each other out. So a lot of us are good at and we're experienced at fighting with our family or fighting in our family. But today I want to talk about a different kind of family fight that I think every family needs to have. I want to turn for a minute to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is not a book that you typically think to look, you know, to look to for anything about family. But but in Nehemiah chapter four, there are a couple verses about the kind of family fight that I think is good and healthy. 
There's some backstory that I want to share with you on Nehemiah. The backstory is that the Babylonians, Babylonian Empire, had destroyed the city of Jerusalem in about 587 BC. And so at that point, the Jewish people were taken into exile in Babylon, and Nehemiah was born to a Jewish family in Babylon. Well, then in around 445 BC, Nehemiah had grown up, and he asked the king for permission to return because he wanted to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. He wanted it to be like a real city again. And so Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem, and and when he did that, he enlisted the help of the Jewish people who were there, and they began the work of rebuilding the walls together. But the problem was, when the Jewish people were taken into exile, it created space for some other people to move into the land. And so not everybody was happy to see that the Jewish people were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And so some of those people who lived in the land, who were enemies of the Jews, and they saw the work that was happening, The very last thing they wanted was for Jerusalem to become a walled city again. And so they started threatening to attack the city and the people who were rebuilding the walls. It even says in the book of Nehemiah that that some of the people were rebuilding the walls and they were were holding a sword in one hand and rebuilding with the other because they were on this, this super high alert about being attacked. Uh, it would be like if, if the people working on our building this week were walking around the construction site and had a hammer in one hand and a gun in the other. It's just this high alert situation, a lot of tension. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of struggle. And so Nehemiah is writing this book in his own words. And if you start in chapter four, verse seven, here's what it says. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod. Now, these were the people who were the enemies of the Jewish people. So they were opposed to the rebuilding of the walls. And it says, when they heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed, Nehemiah says, but we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And then in verse 10, it says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. You ever feel like that in your family? Just like like you're under attack from all directions, wherever you turn. I mean, maybe something's not going well. Somebody's sick. You lose your job. I mean, maybe you feel under attack from your calendar or your schedule. Maybe you feel under attack from the culture in some way. And sometimes it it can even feel like this underlying spiritual attack, or maybe you can't quite name what it is, but there's just some kind of deep underlying force that's causing you to be at odds with your family. Well, here's what Nehemiah does in response to the pending attack that his people were facing. It says, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. So Nehemiah makes this strategic move where he he wants to identify the lowest places of the wall. He wants to identify the the places in the wall that are most susceptible to attack. And he wants to place guards in those places to ward off the enemy. So therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. So he takes full families and he posts them together with weapons. Right, imagine your eight-year-old standing by you holding a sword or a spear or a bow in case of attack. Well, after I looked things over, he says, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. So he's talking to them. He's knowing that they're feeling under attack. And he's saying, don't be afraid. Instead, remember the Lord, right? In the places where you feel under attack in your family, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Remember that the Lord has something bigger than this moment in mind for you. And here's what he says. And fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes, right? As families, we can, we can spend a lot of time fighting with each other 
and we can spend time fighting against each other, and we can spend time fighting about each other, but Nehemiah changes the preposition in that sentence, and he instructs the people to fight for their family. And something changes in the dynamic of a family that chooses to fight for each other instead of against each other. Rick Warren, who is the, uh, he's a pastor at Saddleback Church in California. He preached on the topic of family fights several years ago. And, and he said this, he said, you have to fight for your family. And he said, families aren't awesome by accident. Families are just average by accident. And if you want something different for your family, you have to fight for it. You have to fight for your family. Families aren't awesome by accident. Families are average by accident. And if you want something different for your family, you have to fight for it. Well, I want to share with you quickly five fights that I think are worth having for your family, no matter what phase or configuration your family is in right now. So the first fight I want to encourage you to have is the fight for time. The fight for time. I said this last week, but the the time we have with our families is finite. The clock is ticking. On average, there are 936 weeks between the day a child is born and the day they graduate from high school. But some families approach time like it's unlimited and they just they just give it away or they waste it away or they wait it away or they put it off until tomorrow. Uh, the New Testament author James, he talks about time like this in James 4, 13 through 14. He says this, now listen, You who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. And then he says this, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So many of us have lives that are just completely run by our calendars and they're filled with activity and our family time is prioritized by what other people's schedules dictate. Uh, Last year, at this time, many of us were given the gift of time. I mean, it's May and if you have kids, especially May is one of the craziest times of the year. End of year projects and exams and parties and sports and graduations from everything. Amanda and I were talking this week and she said, I'd like to tell every couple who thinks they should get married in May, don't do it, right? Save yourself. But do you remember last May? I mean, a year ago, last spring, when everything was canceled and every calendar was cleared for a little while, do you know what I heard people say more than anything else? I heard people say, listen, it's it's a weird thing to have everything canceled, but it's so good to have extra time with my family. Psalm 90 verse 12 is a prayer to God and it says this. I love this prayer. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So I just want to ask you, are you in control of your family calendar or is your family calendar in control of you? I mean, are you intentional with your time or is the clock just ticking uncontrollably for you? Because one fight worth having in your family is a fight for time. The second fight I want to encourage you to have is the fight for relationship. At the heart of family is relationship. That's what makes a family a family, the quality of the relationships you have with each other. That's at the heart of what it means to be a family. And Jesus actually has a lot to say about relationship. In Matthew 22, a group of religious leaders come to Jesus and they ask him a question about the greatest commandment. So in the Old Testament, there are 613 different commandments. And so some of the religious leaders, they come to Jesus and they ask him, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of all the 613? What's the greatest? And he answers them with this. Says Jesus replied, you know this, maybe you've heard this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the religious leaders ask Jesus a rules question. They want to know out of all 613 rules, which rule is the most important? And instead he gives them a relationship answer. He says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on all these or on these two commandments. In other words, all the rules hang on the relationship. The relationship is the skeleton or the foundation 
for all the rules. Now, I know, uh, having experienced family, that some of us grew up with an understanding that families are either rules-based or relationship-based. I don't know about you, but I'm often more of a rules-based parent, if I, if I have to admit it. I mean, if you follow the rules, if you do what I say when I say it, the first time I say it, you're going to be happier, and I'm going to be happier, and it's going to be better in our house. And then some of us are more relationship-based in parenting. Less rules, less boundaries. All we need is love, you know, it's that, that kind of thing. But in a family, you need both. I'll admit, Amanda is so much better at this than I am in parenting. She's got a she's got a much healthier perspective on this. And so she'll ask me sometimes, like, hey, what's your desired outcome? I mean, do I want them to follow the rules just to follow the rules because I said so? Or do I want to have an ongoing relationship with them? And I'm usually like, well, I'd like both, please. But the reality in family is that if you're a parent, you're going to have about 10 years of control. But then hopefully you're going to have 30 or 40 years of relationship and influence. And so how do you fight for the relationship with your family? Well, a few simple things. One is to fight for the time. Like I said earlier, it's to fight for the time so that you can have the time to build the relationship. If you don't spend any time together, you don't have any room for a relationship. A few other things, and I could spend a lot of time on each of these, but here they are just in list form. Put down your phone. Talk less and listen more. Engage your people, the people around you and your family. Engage them in things that are interesting to them. Point out the good things you see in them and the ways that you see God working in them. Those are just a few ways, but a fight worth having in your family is the fight for relationship. The third fight I want to encourage you to have, I like this one, is the fight for fun. The reality is most families I know are are too tired and too stressed out and too busy and too overcommitted, and we need to fight for fun with each other. 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says, God richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. The reality is God wants us to enjoy life. God doesn't just want us to endure life. Ecclesiastes 11.8 says, when people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. Ecclesiastes 9.9 says, enjoy life with your wife whom you love, right? When parents love each other and enjoy each other and have fun together, it creates stability for the kids. So if you're a parent, your kids need to see you loving each other and having fun together. And then Ecclesiastes 8.15, it's one of my new favorite verses in the Bible. It says this, so I recommend having fun because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat drink, and enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. God gives work and God gives happiness. Families need time to play together, to laugh together, to have fun together, to play games together. And if you're in a family, you don't always remember all the specifics of what you do together, but you do remember what it feels like when you are together. So is your family all stress, all business, all go all the time? Because one fight worth having in your family is a fight for fun. Now, the fourth fight I want to encourage you to have is the fight for growth. Fight to create an atmosphere of lifelong learning in your family. One where you never stop growing and you're encouraging each other to keep growing. Uh, there's actually only one story in the Bible about Jesus as a teenager or a preteen, and, and it happens in Luke chapter 2 when he's 12 years old. And at the end of that story that it tells about Jesus as a 12-year-old, it describes Jesus as a teenager. And Luke 2.52 says this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with men. Jesus grew in wisdom mentally. He grew in stature physically. He grew in favor with God spiritually. And he grew in favor with men or with people relationally. One way to remember that is is that Jesus grew in RPMs. RPMs, relationally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. It's worth fighting for your family to grow in these four ways. To fight to make space for growth to happen. To fight to build family habits that are healthy. To fight to do things differently than everybody else so that we can have families that are different than the average family. A couple years ago, one of our boys, we were standing in the kitchen and one of our boys said something like, but everybody else gets to. And without missing a beat, Amanda said something like, well, I don't want you to be like everybody else. I want you to be exceptional. One fight worth having in your family 
is a fight for growth, relational, physical, mental, and spiritual growth. And then the last fight, the final fight I want to encourage you to have is the fight for faith. The fight for faith. Listen, more than anything else, I want my own kids to grow up and to follow Jesus. And I want your kids and your grandkids and all the kids that we know together to grow up and follow Jesus because I think that's the absolute best thing for them. But here's the question. It's a question I'm asking myself about that as I do some evaluation on my own life and my own faith. And it's simply this. When my kids look at me and when your kids or grandkids or the kids in our church look at you and they see us living out our faith, are we showing them something that they want to have? Because the truth for all of us is that we inspire faith by our life more than we instruct it with our mouth. There's this great story in the book, A Million Miles in a Thousand Years by Donald Miller. Great book. I recommend it to you if you haven't read it. And and Miller tells the story of a conversation that he had with a friend. So this friend's daughter was living um, what he called a less than kind of story. And and she had a boyfriend who was a really bad influence on her. And and she was making some choices that, that really weren't consistent with their values as a family. And, and Miller writes this. He says, I looked at him and I said, well, who's writing the more exciting story, you or the boyfriend? Because your daughter is looking for adventure and your daughter is looking for fun and she's looking for someone to connect with. And right now, his story looks a lot better than your story. So the dad took that to heart and he went home and he gathered his family and he said, hey, I heard about a guy in Mexico who's trying to build an orphanage and it's going to take $20,000 to do it. And I want us to do it as a family. And so right then they started dreaming and planning about how they were going to raise $20,000 as a family. And they started working on it together. And in a matter of weeks, the boyfriend was long gone. I, I already know some of you with daughters right now, you're already searching for where you can build an orphanage. Right? Maybe you do need to build an orphanage, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is this. Live a faith worth replicating. I mean, maybe you do need to build an orphanage, but maybe you just need to start praying together and dreaming together and living your life for the sake of other people in a way that it inspires the people around you. A fight worth having in your family is a fight for faith. A fight to have a faith that's worth replicating. Nehemiah said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Fight for time. Fight for relationship. Fight for fun. Fight for growth. Fight for faith. These are fights that are worth having. I want to pray for us right now, and I want to pray for us that we be families who fight for each other. And so I want to ask you, if you would, to close your eyes, wherever you are, take a deep breath. I want you to picture your family, those people who are the closest to you in the world. Maybe it's your biological family. Maybe it's an extended family. I want you to picture them right now. The people that you'd do anything for. The people that you'd sacrifice anything for. The people who are your people. God, we pray for the people that are in our minds and in our hearts right now. We are thankful that we get to be family with them. We thank you for their gifts. We thank you for uh, the joy that they bring into our lives. We thank you for the challenge that they bring into our lives. We thank you for the things we love about them. We thank you for the things that bother us about them. And God, ultimately, we just thank you for the gift of family. And God, I pray right now that you'd help us to be the kind of people who are willing to fight for our families. God, help us to fight for time. God, help us to fight for the relationships that we have. 
Help us to fight for fun. Help us to fight for growth. And help us to fight to have a faith that's worth replicating together. God, we lift these people up to you. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit that all of us would grow closer to each other and we'd grow closer to Jesus. Give us courage and boldness and faithfulness to follow him together as a family. We pray these things in his name. Amen.